This is BJD Beautifully Jagged Dolls channel where we are going to remake a string ball jointed doll. The scene is December 24th, Christmas Eve. But where's Eve? It isn't Christmas Eve without Eve. So sit back, relax, while we bring you our version of Christmas Eve. Hello everyone, I'm Pat and it's time for the face up. So she will have these brown eyes and they will complement the warm tones of the browns and the deep reds that we're going to use for her face up. So I've already applied a coat of Mr. Super Clear so that the pan pastels will go on evenly. And I'm starting with a light tint first. This is actually a red iron oxide tint that I'm starting with around the eyes. Then I'll move to some darker shades as we go. So I'm applying this lighter shade all around her nose, her mouth, her eyes, her cheekbones. But I'm trying not to oversaturate the surface because whenever I come back with the darker tone, it'll be hard to apply it unless you add another layer of Mr. Super Clear. So now I'm applying that darker shade. It's called Burnt Sienna Shade around the eyes. And here I'm adding more of it around her nose and mouth. So our first layer of color is done and I've added another layer of Mr. Super Clear so we should be ready to continue adding more color. One of the things to think about with pastels and watercolor pencils is that they do react a little bit to Mr. Super Clear. Just like adding water to uh, watercolor pencils don't be surprised if your color gets knocked down a little bit. So go slow, just add more layers and more color as you go. You'll get used to it. Not all of these tints react that way, but some do. Some watercolors get a lot lighter and others don't react quite so boldly to it. But don't be surprised if you have to add more color. So you'll notice I've added a medium shade in this. It's just burnt sienna. The other dark brown is a burnt sienna shade, but this is just burnt sienna that I'm adding. And it's another layer of color and it's blending those two previous colors together. Still adding more contrast around the eyes. And it's time to give the ears some more attention to plenty of shading inside the ears and don't forget the jawline back behind the ears and now we're getting pretty saturated again it's time for another coat of mr super clear so i ended up deciding to bring her eyeshadow out a little bit it needed to be extended out So now I'm bringing in a dark brown watercolor pencil to draw in the crease in her eyelid. Once I'm happy with the crease, I start shading around that eyelid. coloring in this entire eyelid with this dark brown and I really think that's going to help the eyes pop and stand out. And I start extending that tear duct down a little bit too, giving her a little bit more of a cat eye kind of a look. And now I'm shading her lower eyelid, adding some dark eyeliner down there. I like the first one. Am I going to be able to duplicate it on her right eye? <laughs> I hope so. 
I mean, let's face it, symmetry is hard. So after bouncing back and forth between the eyes, adding a little thing here and there, this is how it turned out. So, so far so good. All right, it's time to move on to her lips, her mouth. I'm outlining them before I decide to shade them. I'm gonna have a couple different shades of red, actually several different colors I'm gonna use on her mouth. And actually in this case, I am just mapping out where I'm going to paint. I'm gonna come back with some acrylic paint and actually paint these lips because they're going to be much bolder than you would get with uh, watercolor pencils. So I'm just mapping this out, really deciding how I want her lips shaped and where it's all going to end up laid out. So here we are, I've got a brown and a deep red. I went into the, the crease in her mouth with a dark brown and then I'm going to use the deep red for her lipstick. Right, we're a lot further along, a lot darker now. That deep red is really, really working well. Now, as we approach this next section, I have a confession to make. I have a fear of eyebrows. I don't mean like trichophobia, trichophobia, afraid of hair. I just mean eyebrows are tricky. If you get them wrong, you get one too high, you look like Spock, or you look like this gal. <laughs> if you get them too bushy, or you make them look like angry bird eyebrows, they are tricky. You have to get them right. And if I paint them, this is where it all goes wrong. This is where I get stressed out. If I paint them and I get it wrong, it blows the entire face and I have to start all over again. This is, this is not a good thing. And what am I doing here? I'm painting the lips, I've done the eyes, and I've saved the eyebrows for last. This is a recipe for disaster. So here we are, the mouth is done, there's no more time left. It's time to face my fear. It's time to just go in and start blocking it in, start laying it out. I've got a lighter colored watercolor pencil here to just kind of lightly sketch it in. So even if I do make a mistake, I can erase it here. I've already gone over this with Mr. Super Clear, so it should be erasable. So that helps with the anxiety a little bit. See, eyebrows are, are just tricky, and I feel like it's a perishable skill. It's something that you do need to practice and stay on top of if you need to break out the sketchbook and just practice doing your eyebrows every once in a while. If you're like me, that you have trouble with symmetry Practice, practice, practice. That's the best thing that you can do. That's my best recommendation. Practice and study. <laughs> Look at reference pictures. Do whatever you need to do so that you can get over that hurdle. Sketch it in really lightly. Make it so that you can erase it. And once you like that outline, here we go. We're going in with a darker colored pencil and I'm doing it. Now, I'm not making these pristine, beautiful model eyebrows in this case. I'm actually intentionally, believe it or not, making these imperfect. I'm happy with the outline, I'm happy with the arch, and I, I'm sketching them in after that. You'll notice whenever it's done that there, there are a couple hairs that are kind of out of place. And honestly, I wanted that natural look so let me know in the comments what you think was this a good decision my anxiety hopes that it was a good decision so let me know what you think i didn't make these dark i know that 
bushy eyebrows are in and these really aren't that bushy but this is what I thought fit her face so let me know in the comments what you think so here she is all finished her mouth her eyes her eyebrows her eyebrows aren't super dark but there you go it's time to pass her on to Belinda. Okay, it's time to make the jacket and I start by using a satin type fabric for the lining. I really like this kind of fabric. It's just lighter weight for lining. And I'm here I'm placing the doll on his side because I'm going to use a vanishing marking pencil to draw an outline of how I want the jacket. What I like about these marking pencils is they just wash right out. That's why they're called vanishing pencils. These are called framing square rulers and they are used by carpenters and a must for every seamstress. I could not do without these. I actually have two different sizes. Here I'm marking the lines to make sure that they are straight on the hem and on the sides and on the sleeves as well. Now I'm cutting out the lining. Once I've got the lining cut out, I notice it looks a little too big so I decided to cut it down some. That's where these framing rulers come in. This is a smaller one and I also use the bigger one. Once I get it cut down, then I'm going to cut along the fold and this is where the jacket opening will be. Then I'm going to cut out this corner and this is the neckline where I will be able to attach the collar. It looks pretty good. Okay, this fabric is called Snow White Plush Felt. I really like it. It's inexpensive and, but it doesn't get fuzzies all over your house whenever you are using it to make any kind of garments. Here I am using the lining and pinning it on this plush fabric because I'm going to use this lining as a pattern. Once I get it cut out, I remove all the pins and then I'm going to cut out the corner again for the same reason I did the lining so that I have the neckline opening for the collar. Then I'm also going to cut open the whole front so that I have this front opening for the jacket. Once I get this opening cut, I'm a little slow, but I get it. So now I have both the lining and the jacket all cut out and ready to be sewn together. Here I've decided I wanted the collar to be about an inch in height, but I have to cut it a, a little bit bigger than that, probably about a quarter of an inch more because I need some seam, seam allowance. And I'm cutting two of these so that I have the lining on the inside of the collar and I want it fuzzy on the inside and the outside. And I am cutting the edges because I'm going to taper the collar so that it gets smaller as it goes down the front opening. The sleeves and the sides are now sewn and the collar is attached. Now I just need to sew the lining to the jacket. After sewing the lining to the jacket with the right sides together, I turn lining and insert the jacket sleeves. I like lining because it hides all those raw seam edges and just makes the whole jacket look nicer. After the lining is attached, I add an outline stitch around the hem and all the way up the front of the jacket. Then I pin the lining to the collar and after I get this lining pinned, I'm going to stitch it on the sewing machine. Once I've got it all stitched into place, I pin the collar over the lining seam. It's going to look really nice once this is all stitched down. And I'm going to stitch all this by hand. Once all that's pinned down, I make sure that the tapered ends match. After making sure the tapered ends match, then I use a whip stitch for the tapered ends. This just gives it a nice smooth edge so there's no opening. For the rest of the collar I use a blind stitch which I did not do under the camera and I'm very sorry about that. I attach the lining sleeve to the jacket using a slip stitch. Jack is done and it fits. Hooray! To 
make the bandeau, I first measure the chest of the doll using a either a soft plastic or a fabric measuring tape. You can get them at Walmart or anywhere they sell sewing supplies. I always add like a quarter of an inch for seam allowance. Here I measure the length. Then I use a rotary cutter and my lovely, wonderful framing ruler to cut out the halter top. I like using a rotary cutter anytime I need to cut a straight edge. Here I put the fabric on the doll to see where I want the darts to be. Then I use the marking pencil and I mark where I want them. Once I've done that, I make kind of a V shape that goes on both sides of the lines. And then I put these the lining next to it so I can mark them and get them in the very same place. To make the job easier, try using tracing paper. A lot of people get intimidated when making darts. They're really not that difficult. The center line, just fold your fabric and make sure it's straight on the edge. You're going to sew down that half V side. Just line up your needle and drop it. And you're going to sew just going toward that angle until you get to the very end peak. Just keep going in that stitch a little bit. And it's really that simple. I'm using stretchy fabric with kind of a felt filling on it. This is common for Halloween enthusiasts this fabric is. A lot of people do not like to use it because of the stretchiness. It is very intimidating and it's very difficult if, to remove stitches. So if you are prone to having to remove stitches you may not want to use this fabric or if you're a beginner sewer. Anyway, there's the dart, and when you turn the fabric, this is how the dart looks, and you do the same on the other side. The first bandeau I made with a heart shape at the top, and I didn't really like it, and I wanted it shorter, so I end up making a complete different bandeau, which I'm going to show you after I make the skirt, although the darts are still the same. First, I measure the doll's waistline, adding about a fourth of an inch for the seam allowance. First folding the fabric, I then mark the measurements. Using my framing ruler, I mark the skirt on the back in an angle. I want the bottom of it rounded, but I do not want it a circle skirt. To get the curved edge on the hem, I actually use what a lot of people call dressmaking curved rulers, or I just call them sewing rulers. They're plastic and they are they have different shapes so you can cut different angles and shapes unfortunately I didn't get this under the camera it looks like I'm getting good at that sorry here I cut sections out of the front of the skirt because I wanted to add lace along the front I just thought it would look really pretty the lace is now sewn onto the front of the skirt and I will be adding elastic around the waistline now that the skirt is done and it fits it is time to make the second bendo once I've cut the second bodice out, I sew a seam on the top and one on the bottom, and then I turn it right side out with the help of a stick that I get out of the polyfill stuffing. Yeah, I have a lot of these. Then I close the ends of it by folding it in and sewing an outline seam, and next is going to be grommet time. This thing is set to the length I want it. Then I take the fabric, put it here, and then I'm going to punch it through, hear it pop, and that will give me my hole. Then I will take, then I take the grommet that I want to use, and I push it through the hole to the other side. This one, I have rings that go on it. Once that's placed over it, just lay it flat on the little metal block, add my little tool, tap on the tool a few times, and voila, grommets in and looks beautiful. I do that on both sides. Originally, I wanted to use silver because I'm just not a big gold fan, but Pat really liked the gold and I already had it on hand, so I went with the gold and in the end, I'm glad I did. It turned out really pretty. So here, I'm just taking some gold, cheap gold ribbon that has wire in it and lacing the back of the bandeau. Now that the bandeau is done, I decide to add a little bit of gold ribbon to the front of the skirt and to the bandeau front to just help it blend in with the gold ribbon so the gold ribbon doesn't just kind of stand out all by itself. 
just to prevent the edges of the ribbon from raveling I just kind of singe off the edges and I did the same thing for the tie for the bandeau. I also attached some of the gold ribbon to the front of the bandeau. I just think that touch looks really good. Here I've cut a two inch wide piece of the white plush felt that I used to make the jacket and I cut it the length of the skirt. I stitched it by machine onto the skirt and folded it over and now I am doing a blind stitch. Okay, now the bandeau, the skirt, and the jacket are all done and I'm really, really happy with the way they turned out. I think they're so, so pretty. Okay, next Pat will paint the shoes and I will make the wigs and then she'll be done. Pat is taking the shoes that came with the Menifee when we bought her and he is painting them with a nail polish. He is using Wet n Wild and he is painting them with the color Grape Minds Think Alike. Yep, you heard me right. <laughs> Placing the shoes upside down in a paint palette tray, he paints the tips of the heels black and the bottom sole of the shoes black as well. With a steady hand, Pat uses fingernail polish. He uses LA Colors Color Craze number 412, which is a black and it comes with hardeners. Makes sense, right? On the bottom of the sole of the shoe, there should be a hardener. <gasps> I guess that wasn't so funny once I said it. Anyway, once he gets the bottom of the shoes painted, he lets them dry before he paints the details. After painting the inside of the shoes black, he then uses the Great Minds Think Alike polish and paints the, all the edges on the shoes. Wow, great steady hand. He also uses the same fingernail polish to polish her nails. Now that the shoes have dried, he begins painting the design with a gold paint. Talk about your steady hand. This is always amazing to me to go back and watch him paint these details. Such tiny, tiny details. Such tiny, tiny brushes. He's got a good steady hand and he is very artistic. Now the shoes are all done, they look beautiful, and they're ready for Christmas Eve. This is a wig I chose because it has a gold tone to it, and I thought it would match the gold in her outfit really well. It is a wig for a larger doll. It came off of a porcelain doll, I believe. I decided I wanted the center and front piece of the wig, so I began by cutting all the edges off of the wig. And I save all of these because these are whiffs that I can make into wigs later on for other dolls. I continue to cut around the wig, removing all the whiffs that I do not want until I get it down to a small enough size to fit this 1 4th scale Minifee doll. I put plastic wrap over the doll's head and I secure it with rubber bands. For the wig cap, I'm using just plain old pantyhose. I get them everywhere. I get them at the thrift store, still packaged. I get them at Dollar Tree. I cut off the toe part and then I take the corners of it and I sew it down to round it out more. I use every bit of the pantyhose. For me, there is no part of it that I waste. I secure the pantyhose over the doll's head that I've removed and put on a little wooden stand that I have made. I secure it with rubber bands. Once I have it secured, then I'm going to use glue and I just use tacky glue, nothing fancy. I take the glue and I use paint brushes and I paint brush the inside of the wig that I have cut down. After I glue the inside of the wig, I also apply glue onto the pantyhose. And the reason why I use 
clear plastic wrap underneath the pantyhose is to help protect the doll's face all the paint everything i just completely cover it all the way down you know underneath the head with the plastic wrap once I have applied the glue evenly inside the wig and on the wig cap, I place the wig on the wig cap on the doll's head and put rubber bands around it to hold it flat and in place and I leave that overnight. Hoping for the best, I now remove the rubber bands that have been on the wig overnight to see how it looks and hopefully it will look really good. Okay, the wig looks good and to protect the doll's head and the paint while I'm trimming the wig I put clear plastic over the doll's head again and I secure it with rubber bands and I put trash bags under her and over her. Now I begin cutting her hair with just some scissors that I bought at Sally's Hair Supply or actually at Sally's Beauty Supply that is made just to cut hair. If you notice whenever I trim the hair I cut the hair with like a moving down motion kind of scraping down the hair as I cut it so I don't get that straight bow look then I take thinning shears and I go over it again just kind of running it through the hair and it just gives it a more natural look so it doesn't look like doll's hair now I have the doll's hair cut to my satisfaction the wig is all done now it's time for the great reveal We are so happy to share Christmas Eve with you.